Hello everyone, and today I'll be playing the Cardinal Park case. After one of your friends is brutally murdered, you're tasked yourself with finding the perpetrator of such a heinous crime. Fortunately, dealing with the fallout of her death and finding the perpetrator proves to be rather difficult for you, even though you should be a hardened detective by now. And additionally, it's one of the weirdest cases that he's worked on, so it's gonna be a lot of weird stuff in this one. Murder, blood, death, stupid jokes. Hot women and men. Oh. Cute cats kissing the dead. Okay. And gore. Uh, nah. Heck no. Now, dear readers, let's begin. Chapter 1 Remains. Hello, Father. How has everything been for you? Ever since the last time our paths converged, I've been up to a lot. I've been cracking cases left and right, just like you would have wanted. At least, that's what I hope I would have- you would have wanted. In spite of this, sometimes I just don't know what I'm doing. I know my seniors at the office are there to guide me and all, even mother could guide me. But I don't think I could ever replace your guidance. Stop it, Oliver. You're not supposed to get getting like this. You prepare yourself to wipe hot tears from your face. And you prepare to tell yourself you're crying because of the frigid air. Before you can do either of those things, however, you feel a small snowflake touch your skin. And before you know it, snow begins falling like feathers from a flock of pigeons at the piece of bread. You whip out an umbrella and respond to the white specks. And just like that, all those thoughts that have been petributing you for the past decade have disappeared. And they're replaced with... Ah. It's nothing. I was supposed to be on my way back anyway. Still though, just my luck for our meeting to get cut short by the weather. Goodbye, Father. I'll see you soon. I like the oh. What the hell are you doing? About to tread on the grave. And disrespect the dead like that. What am I doing? What, you want to reenact that case where the girl was sitting on top of one of those stones? Oh, my bad. You know, if you try to strip and sit on a tombstone, you're gonna die of hypothermia before dying of embarrassment. Well, dang, I didn't know it was that serious. Oh, little birds. Why is there a bottle here? A grave with a bottle of beer stuck in the snow. Can't make out what the name on the tombstone is. Whoever was carving out the name on the grave must have been drinking something to have done a job like this. Still though, you're not about to begin picking apart a shoddy tombstone job. Someone must have been happy enough with it to have it here. This little thing's called look from far, far away and don't touch. Oh, so rude. Walk back to your home. You don't live too far from the graveyard, for better or for worse. At the very least, it makes it easier to wake up early and come here without having to worry about some unholy thing happening to you. Make sure not to announce that you're home as you slip your coat off your shoulders. After all, you know that mother really wouldn't be happy with you going out this early. If I'm recalling the time correctly, classes should be starting soon. I better go upstairs and finish my write-ups. Stairs it is, but we shall explore first. Umbrellas? We have way too many for two people, due to how windy you can get in this city. Look a nice home. Refrigerator unit. You can recall plenty of cases where a body was hidden in the fridge. Sometimes you half expect the body to flop out of here and crash onto you. Thankfully, no one in this household is a murderous psychopath. People who do that, like, the fridge, like, how do you stuff a body in there? Strange, the fireplace has been lit. As tempted as you are not to, are to get cozy near the fireplace, you know that you have more productive things to do right now. Pictures of. Oh. Oh, time to go upstairs. Enough exploring. Oh, wait, there's a downstairs. 
Whenever you look at the stairs to the basement, you're reminded of that case where the corpse of children were kept in the basement. You can vividly remember their bodies carelessly strewn about the floor, surrounded by maggots and roaches. Clearly, you were too late to save them. You were even too late to at least save their corpses from decay. Sometimes when you go down there, you half expect to relive that horrifying scene. Makes me think of like cops and detectives actually do work like this, like... How do you just go to sleep like that nice, seeing like... Depressing things like that. This our room? The only landline in this house. Would you like to enter a phone number? Heck yeah! Oh, I don't know. Sorry, I don't- I don't know any phone number. Mother's jewelry. A good chunk of it was gifted to your mother from your father. Of course, after his death, she was a shit ton of the jewelry, leaving this mere fraction. Strange, she seems to be missing an earring from one of the pairs. Hopefully, the other one turns up soon. So she just sold all of it? Isn't that her husband? I think she would cherish it. This is the way to Mother's closet. You have absolutely no good reason to go in there. Mother... This our room? Wait, let me see. Are you an only child? Is this the bathroom? Ah yes, the door to the most glorious of rooms. The bathroom. In spite of the fact that your diet consists mostly of caffeinated beverages, you don't need to go. Oh, okay. Only child then. No, I'll just leave this here. What are these? If you were a good detective, your papers wouldn't be strewn about on the table this way. At the very least, it's organized chaos to you. An ornate bookshelf doing a serviceable job of holding the books above the ground. Even though you're not a law student, most of these books are about law. Oh, well, I guess that makes sense. In spite of the amount of money you have, you don't really have too many articles of clothing. Well, I've always been more of a quality over quantity type of person. Yeah, that makes sense. What am I doing here again? I don't really need to sleep. Alright, that's not true. You meant to say I don't really need to sleep at all. You sit down at the chair, fighting the childish urge to spin on it. In all honesty, you don't know why you have one of these chairs if you never spun on it. You get to your write-ups, only to fall asleep. That's what you get when you decide to spend an entire night writing, only to sleep for three hours. Since you are asleep, you don't realize. Ugh. Wake up. The look on Mother's face tells you that she's gonna off, going to go off on you. Again. Did you go outside? <sighs> oh, hell no. This is exactly why you decided to wake up at four in the morning to go out. Somehow your poor mother knew. So you got three hours of sleep for no reason. As a result of your terrible attempt at some fro fuge, you will now be the recipient of your mother's poor mother's concerned ramblings. She'll get then get so stressed that she has a heart attack and dies, all because you made her so damn concerned. They both sound very dramatic. What a good son you are. Don't you even bother lying to me. There's snow on your clothing and on your hair. It doesn't take a detective to figure out that you were outside. Every single time you come home from school or work or whatever, the first thing that you do is coop yourself up in here. What compelled you to go outside today of all days? It isn't even that nice outside today. Mother, first off, I like cold weather. The fact that it calms my mind. It's something that I've been really needing. You think I'm nagging you? What? No, you're not nagging me. Where did you get such an idea from? Didn't you imply that I make your mind tired? No, that's not what I'm getting at. I'm just saying that it's nice to get some air. Yeah, right. I believe you. I believe that you love cold, dry air and chapped lips. Well, some people do. How were you really outside? Were you out on a date with someone? Fine, I was at the graveyard. You know, didn't we speak of this? You can't keep holding on to a dead man. That dead man was my father. He was my husband, yet you don't see me moping around over his grave. You really like him then. I'm not moping, I'm just coming to terms with everything. Really, after ten years? You're focused on spending time in his grave, lamenting the fact that he's gone, 
instead of appreciating who's still here with you, your mother. <sighs> How about this? I just baked cookies. Maybe those will get you out of this mood. I'll come down once I finish doing. You're gonna stop spending your days working on these cases. I was actually... Then stop working on schoolwork. <laughs> She's dragging him along. She grabs you by the arm and begins dragging you downstairs, away from your precious case files. Arranged in front of you are two large trays of massive, diabetes-inducing cookies. If the baker wasn't your mother, you assume they're trying to kill you from all this sugar. You know, most parents yell at their children for not doing their work. It seems as though the subject of your conversation with her hasn't changed at all. You're not surprised that the issue has dragged on for this long, but you are starting to want this to stop. I guess that's why... I guess that she's that concerned for me, huh? Instead of yelling at you for ignoring your work, here I am yelling at you for doing work. It's like I can't win. I can't exactly say to anything to her about this. What? Do you... Do you not like spending time with me anymore? Ugh, so much like your father, both in good and bad ways. Her gaze falls on you in anticipation for a response. Of course, when have you ever known to how to comfort her? In the end, you decide that if you can't comfort her with words, you at least comfort her by eating her cookies, as much as you dislike them. You also decide to change the topic of the conversation to something much more lighthearted, like... So Mother, how was last night for you? And I did you know that you were excited about finally going out. Ah, oh, last night was the best night I've ever had since you were born. I met the two nicest gentlemen, and they did a lot for me. Although... I do think that I lost one of my earrings while I was out. Oh, I can help with that. Just tell me where they went, and I'll start with the air area to find the earring. Really, it's fine. I don't need you finding the earring. I have plenty more pairs. Are you sure? It really wouldn't be much of a problem for me, and you get... It's fine. Now, stop dragging on this issue for so long. You force yourself not to sigh in resignation. You know that it would only make this conversation worse. Thus, leaving the two of you to eat those sugar bomb cookies in silence. You quickly finish up your tray and return it to the kitchen. Maybe you finish it up a bit too quickly? In all honesty, you finish up the cookies so quickly because you have classes soon. Though you also know that if you didn't finish the cookies, Mother would accuse you of hating her baking. But that's besides the point. This woman sounds so... She sounds too much. Overbearing, even. However, you know that she'll never take that estimation, even if it is the truth. If I've been a bad mother, is that why you've been looking for excuses to get away from me? Oh man, okay. You know that there's no winning this argument. All you can do is get the heck out of here. Ugh, I can relate so much. It's literally, they just have to ignore and just leave. Me being away from you has nothing to do with you. I just have a lot of work. Yes, work. Long, time-consuming work that forces you out of the house for at least 18 hours a day. If it'll make you a bit happy, I'm not supposed to have any cases to work on for the next few days. So I'll be spending more time with you. And besides, winter break is almost here. So it's just a few more weeks until you have me all to yourself. You promise me that you spend all your time with me? I promise. Ah, good. You best be on your way. Don't forget. I love you more than anyone ever else could. I love you too. Oh, and be home early. It's supposed to snow tonight. I wouldn't want my son to freeze to death. You glance at her in acknowledgement and step outside the house. Winter mornings have always unsettled you a bit. All sound is muffled by the snow, except for the wind's whispers in your ears. His silence acts as a double-edged sword for you. On one hand, it's refreshing to not have a constant noise blasting in your ears, whether it's from the city's ambience or your mother's concern for you. Still though, the air is so still and silent that you feel yourself tense up. It's the perfect time for something horrible to happen to you, or more importantly, to your mother. Snow would muffle the sounds of your screams, if you even could scream.
You're about to continue thinking about all the bad things that could happen when you finally arrive at the train station. You then board the next six trains to Cobalt Street, hoping that there aren't any delays. You gaze at the window, looking at darkness. Very engaging, yes. It's the best way to start the day. Waking up in a dark morning, followed by a dark hour-long train ride. You don't mind it too much, since it makes it much easier to take a very light nap to having your problem mister stop, or get beaten up. Beaten up? Ah, the streets of Libretto City? Just as foggy as it usually is here. Even though you managed to partially drift off to sleep on the train, you're still exhausted. Wouldn't say I'm sleep deprived, but a nice cup of coffee is a perfect way to start the day. I prefer to stop at Moonbills as soon as possible. That place usually gets packed in the morning. Alright, there's lots of stray cats. Oh, it's packed. Just as always, the line is incredibly long at Moonbills. You know, I really thought that arriving early might spare you the pain of waiting for someone to finish ordering a... Extra large Americana with a cup of 0.1% milk. 157 degrees hot. That sounds way too hot. With 111.1 shots of espresso, 69 grams of sugar, pinch of caramel, and cold foam. <laughs> I feel like this is not an exaggeration. Some people are this precise. It was just ridiculous. But it seems as though all these other people had the same idea. Well, at the very least, I don't think that anyone here has the energy to even order the order the range rink, right? I need a small iced latte. Perk up hearing the order, for whatever reason, it seems as though lattes tend to be the most chaotic drinks. With whipped cream, so far nothing too out of the ordinary. But make it mostly whipped cream. I'm on a diet. And I'm not trying to have you screw it up, then why would you go out and get coffee? And I want the whipped cream to be hot. What? I put some diet soda in there. Huh? It's a coffee place. Now. Uh, Ma'am, we don't have diet soda, but we can put in some Splend Splendid sweetness sweetener in it. No, no, don't you dare tell me what to do. Splendid will ruin my diet, so shove some diet soda in there or else. Okay, jeez. So much for a sane drink or a customer that isn't a bit, a bit off the rails. And so much for not uh, talking, taking too long to get a drink. It took around five minutes to make that lady's latte whipped cream thing. Pretty impressive, considering that the barista had to go out to buy some diet soda with- What? I wouldn't do that. Oh god. Around 30 minutes pass before you're finally able to pass your order. Find a place to order, I mean. At the very least, you know that you won't be late for class. As you go to the front of the line to order, you're greeted with the- Hey, Oliver. I wasn't expecting to see you here. Ah, oh, Emma. Didn't expect to see you here at this time. Eh, usually I work the evening shift. No wonder. I haven't seen you here. I never come in that here in the evening. Yeah, unfortunately, my boss is making me work a double shift. With the holidays coming in and stuff, they want all employees on on and all times. Has your boss at least increased your pay? No, you have that much faith in my boss. I mm, guess it was a mistake to assume that your boss would abide by the law. Anyways, enough chatting. What can I get for you? The usual? The usual, huh? I was going to get a latte, but a simple Americano would also be nice, if she does know my style. Let's test it out. I'll have the usual, please. A rice? Or are you seeing enough not to get an ice drink in the middle of winter? Uh, I've been questioning my sanity recently. Lately, but I'm not that far gone yet. Alrighty, your drink will be done in a few seconds. Emma rapidly prepares your drink, and just as she said, she only takes a few seconds. And here's your triple shot Americano that I don't know how you stomach. So, you do know my usual. How'd you figure it out? Do I really look that, like, that much of an Americano person? It's all in the intuition of a barista, hopefully. Enjoy your drink? I will. N oh, please keep the change. You give her a $10 bill, and in return, she gives you the most glorious Americano you've ever laid your eyes upon. Got a triple shot Americano. That kind of sounds nasty. You should probably find somewhere to sit down while you drink this. 
Who's this? Can I talk to you? No? Pass right through you. Oh, right there. Okay, that seems awkward. You sit down in a hard seat, ready to enjoy your daily dose of caffeine. This drink is perfection. Make sure to savor the drink, letting the scalding hot liquid warm your cold throat. Feeling so cozy that you could probably fall asleep here. You're feeling so cozy that you almost forget about the troublesome conversation you have with the mother. And you're feeling so cozy that you almost forget that this place is getting crowded insanely quickly. Of course, that is until this guy comes in. The lightweight taps you on the shoulder. You assume that he's gonna jump you, but instead... Pardon? You're Oliver Cypress, right? Yes, and I know you're from... Dude, we shared a poetry class together. Remember Mrs. Branson's lame class? Ah, oh, I believe I remember you now. You are Cox, correct? Yep, the one and only. Say, I saw you chatting with that barista girl. You were watching us from the window. Yes, I was chatting with her. What significance does it hold to you? Dude, stop with the funny big words. I don't understand the shit you're saying. Big words? Really? You haven't seen anything yet. Anyways, you two seem to have pretty good raptor. Would you have a fellow dude out by telling me about her? Information isn't for me to disclose. It's her choice to do so. Come on, not even a name? Ugh, fine. Her name is Emma. Ah, uh, thanks, man. Watch as I win this girl over. I'm gonna regret helping him out, aren't I? He just skipped. Upon watching Edward shove everyone aside, you unfortunately realize that you were correct in regretting this. Behold, an entitled brat attempts to date your friend. You know that she deserves much, much better than him, better than you, even. Not that you're even interested in the first place. And you know, you want to know why this is happening to her now. It's all because you, Mr. Prodigy Detective, decided to tell this guy her name. Bravo, you just disclosed the most valuable piece of identification to a scumbag that totally won't harass her. And you want to know why you're not getting your sorry stuff up to stop this? You're too engrossed by those, these stupid thoughts to even realize that you could just go up there and stop this scene. With how shit you are with people, I wouldn't be surprised if... Ugh, hey pretty. Well, you blew your chance at stopping this from being initiated. Hey, you can't just cut the line. Who do you think you are, the damn Queen of Scots? Ugh, whatever. I'm basically the freaking prince of the city. Lines don't apply to me. Oh uh, yeah, they apply, do apply to you. If you want to order, then you gotta go to the back of the line like everyone else. All I wanted to do was chat with a pretty girl like you. But if you were gonna chat with me, do it some other time, alright? You do this all the time, and it's very uncomfortable for everyone here. Come on, please. No. Mortified by the fact that you just got scolded by a peasant like Emma. Edward leaves Moonbills with his tail between his legs. <laughs> At the same time, Emma continues making drinks like nothing happens. Thankfully, that didn't escalate, due to the fact that Edward is a pathetic idiot. However, being the paranoid detective that you are, you ponder what could have happened had Edward even just a bit more unhinged. And you also realize that Emma's usual smile is just slightly downturned. It's pretty much my fault that she got humiliated. I should have stopped him. Yeah, dude. I know that the classes start soon, but I think I should check up, up on Emma right now. You get online and wait yet again to order a... You don't know what to order. But that doesn't really matter right now. Oh, Oliver, you're back. You like to drink, right? Yes, I liked it very much. It was much better than what I originally wanted. I'm just here to order a croissant. All right, one croissant coming right up. Glance down to make sure that no one is here. He speaks softly, much softer than usual. Emma, can I speak to you? Aw, oh, you saw how I went for the last guy you tried to speak to me. Just wanted to check up on you. What is it to check up on me about? You know, the guy treating you like that. I just wanted to make sure that you were okay before leaving. Of course I am. There's customers like that all the time here. Nothing I can't handle. Well, you shouldn't have to put up with that. 
I might not have much of a right to speak on the matter, but I just think that it feels... Demeaning? Her happy mask lit off just like that. You start feeling an all too familiar feeling of guilt, even if you haven't broken the law. Obviously, it's pretty shitty that Emma's dealing with harassment, but it's even shittier that you just made today worse for her. You mentioned that he's been doing this every day, right? Maybe I can have a little chat with him? I could perhaps knock some sense into him? No, thanks, really, it's blind, but thanks for the thought. Besides, I know that your definition of a friendly chat with him would involve that little thing of pepper spray you've got there. What pepper spray? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Alright, you got me. Don't worry about me, I can handle myself just fine. Okay, Emma, if you say so, but if you ever need anything, I'll be there for you. You and Emma exchange glasses as she hands you the croissant you forgot to order. You give her a $10 bill for a croissant? Are you serious? Oh, wait. And request that she keep the change. Oh, okay. Just the change. I was like, $10 for a freaking croissant? And just like that, you walk out of Boom Bills. As you walk out, you're pretty sure that through the corner of your eye, you see Emma blushing a bit. You just chalk it up to the lightning, though. Oh, she obviously likes you, dude. Alright, I better head to classes now. I wouldn't want to be late too late. Time to go to the city. Continue walking down the streets and finally arrive at Liber Libretto University. Most of the day consists of sitting around, listening to lectures, and writing so much that your hand burns with pain. You view, you view it as a bit of a waste of time. Not because you hate your classes or anything like that, but more so because you'd rather be cracking cases. After a long, long day of boring stuff that I'm not even going to get into, you go to the university's library. Let's see, I need to finish up all my schoolwork as soon as possible. That way I can get to working on cases. And as soon as I do that, I'll just stop like I promised mother. You get straight to writing, dread gluing your pen to the page. You know that once you get this essay done, you have to get through a few more write-ups, analysis, poems, all that good stuff. You also know that if you don't finish it fast enough, mother's gonna grow more and more anxious because of you. Your writing becomes sharper as you rapidly scribble on words on the page. But you're just getting into the flow of it. Hey. Ah, oh, shit. What the hell was that shit you pulled on Moonbills? I don't exactly follow. Why didn't you tell me that Emma's one of those girls? What do you even mean by that? Why she maybe goes to the back of the line, huh? You really don't feel like putting up with Edward Cox's bullshit. Oh, I don't know, maybe it was because you were cutting? Uh, Look, I'm not going to sit here and tolerate your complaints with em about Emma, okay? You usually stop boy morphs into an icy hiss. You don't like hearing yourself like this, but it's what must be done. I mean, not even you take your normal voice all that seriously, preferring to make mask it with ice when speaking to hardened criminals. And idiotic classmates, it seems. If I knew that you were going to humiliate yourself and Emma like that, wouldn't I have even told you her name? I wasn't making a fool of myself. You should have been flattered that I was willing to do something embarrassing for her sake. You didn't cut in line for her sake, and she doesn't even know you. She doesn't know what she, that she's going to love me, okay? You decide to turn to your last resort to shut this guy up. You know, the more you speak like this, the less inclined I am to believe your argument. It reminds me of this one assault case. The perpetrator spoke of the victim in that exact manner. Oh hell no, you're not going to go off on a crime tangent with me. If it'll get you to stop pestering women, then I'll gladly do it. Besides, I like talking about these cases. They teach you a thing or two about people, so don't think that I'm just doing this for your sake. I wish stares at you apathetically, clearly not moved by your words. He begins to drag himself away from you, shoulders slumped from boredom. Whatever, I'm just gonna go to class now. There's no difference between hearing you lecture and hearing the professor le lecture. You must have done something right to make the slacker go to class instead of cut it. <laughs> you think nothing of it. You're just glad the argument didn't escalate. You attempt to return to writing, but an air of resentment from the argument hangs over the area. 
promptly leading you to getting the heck out of there. Even though this air is parching my throat, it still feels quite pleasant. Says you, a man who usually keeps himself cooped up either in university office or bedroom. Any sort of natural air is gonna feel refreshing, even if it's natural air tainted by industrial smoke. I have a good amount of time if her mother is expecting me home, so maybe I can get my work done at Cardinal Park? I do think I should check up on Emma before I do that, though. Hopefully Emma's okay. Upon entering the now empty line, you see that Emma is nowhere to be found. Can't she mention working a double shift today? Hello, what can I get for you today? Uh, may I have a... Um... Usually you rehearse your order in your head before you return to place it. Fortunately, you didn't do this this time. Thankfully, you aren't putting the line to a halt, because there is no line. Quickly glance up at the menu and say the first thing you see. You manage to stutter out. May I have a mini pumpkin cinnamon latte? Wait a damn minute, I hate those! Would you like that with almond milk? Now thinking you say, yes please. <laughs> this drink is gonna be shit now, isn't it? Now if you weren't thinking about how inconvenient it would be for the barista, you would have changed your order. Fortunately, you're crap at talking to strangers, if it wasn't that obvious. And you would like, would you like it iced? Yes please, yes to everything. Alright, one weird ass latte coming up. <laughs> what the fuck, Oliver? Did you just say you want to change the damn thing? You know what? That doesn't matter. I'm already in too deep. Besides, I'm not really here for the drink. Um, excuse me, I have a question about one of your employees, Emma Greenlord. What, she in trouble for something? What? No, I just... I'm a friend of hers. Do you happen to know where she is? As you feel heat crawling up your skin, the barista retorts with... Shouldn't you know where your friend is? Uh, well, GM works here. She's meant to be on this shift. You know the detective kid from the news. Shouldn't you know where she is? They giggle a bit as you feel the burning envelope envelop your body from head to toe. I don't. It's fine, man. We don't publicize our schedules. She should be on lunch breaks right now, but I just clocked in, so don't chastise me if I'm wrong. Oh. Um, thank you? Barista hands you your shitty drink. Bear in mind that it's your fault that it's shitty and you hand them money. You gotta wear that latte. Cinnamon, I feel like that'll be popular. That'll be a popular drink. Especially with the pumpkin in it? Yeah. They walk out of Moonbills, dissatisfied with their information. And holding a shitty latte. Uh, guess I could just talk to Emma in an hour. The lunch break should be over by then. They have an hour lunch breaks? For now, I guess I'll just go over to the Cardinal Park. I really do need the fresh air. I'm guessing it's this way? Go to the subway? You don't need to go home just yet. You'd rather stay out a bit longer than deal with mothers playing ramblings. Up here and... This cat seems to be blocking the path into this alleyway. You have no clue why a cat would want to be out while it's snowing. From your knowledge, you prefer laying down boxes, all compressed and cozy. Dude, cat. I need to go. Um... Wanna escape this prison of a body and get run over? Heck no. Didn't think so. Even though death is constantly crossing your mind, you don't wish to die. One thing. So many people's lives get cut short against their will. To you, it would be an insult to those people to go off yourself. You do look second. You do like the thrill of an adrenaline that comes from detective work. And finally, your poor mother wouldn't know what to do with herself without you. She literally wouldn't. Even though you'd be dead, you'd rather not have your death so negatively affect her, like how your father's did. So where do I go from here? Oh, up here. Okay, duh. Ah, Cardinal Park. Focal point of Libretto City, its crowning jewel. It's called Cardinal Park for the red maple trees that dot every foot of the park. Even in this cold weather, the trees have retained their blood red leaves. Oh. Contrasting perfectly with the dull fog that permeates throughout the city. 
Between school, work, and mother, you don't find yourself here very often. Not to mention that it's been far too cold out for you to even want to spend another minute outside. Thankfully, today is a break from the painfully montaneous schedule you usually follow. Dawn is walking up, attending university, working, and listening to mother's worries. Today is wake up, attend university, go to Cardinal Park, go to work, and listen to mother's worries. Wait, that's not right. You're not supposed to work today. Guess it's just a force of habit to think that way though, even if mother wouldn't be too pleased with you putting work over family time. As your gaze makes contact with a frozen river, you can see people on the ice, doing all sorts of stuff, inspired the warning sign. I don't know why people play with their life like that. Oh, someone crossed it out, so they say go on the ice. Including but not limited to jumping up and down, shoving a knife in the ice, playing basketball, basketball, and doing all sorts of stupid things. Oh my god. It isn't like telling these people to stop will make them stop. Hell, someone even vandalized that sound and sign over there. Right, I'm going to try not to worry about it too much. I'll just get my work done and go straight home. You take a sip from the weird ass pumpkin cinnamon latte you just ordered, a complete screw up of a drink. You then proceed to wonder why you're so damn socially inept as the frigid liquid moves down your throat. Setting the drink aside, you pull out your papers and begin writing. You're really getting into the flow of it. Surely nothing's gonna interrupt your flow. And someone fell into the ice. A high pitched screech star reaches you, jolting you up. You stare at the source of the noise. Oh goodness, of course something like this would happen. I mean, if this happens, would you really- Would I really feel bad like this? Cause like, why would you go on the ice like that? You rush over to stop a preventable death, keeping in mind that you could have told her to get off the ice. Thankfully, before she succumbs to hyperthermia, you manage to pull her out. Her body sh shivering body runs into yours, leaving you in quite the awkward position. Like, thanks for getting me out. It was so gross under there. It was nothing, but I need you to take you to the hospital or something. You're freezing right now. No thanks, it's alright, but so, like, I touched the body down there and it was so gross. No, no, really, let me take you to... Wait. A body? Her upbeat nature betrays that <laughs> she's like, wait, she says a body and she's just like calm and collected like, yeah, I saw a body down there. What the heck? Are you, are you a mortician? Her upbeat nature betrays the message her words bring. A body? Under the ice? No, surely it's her hypothermia speaking, right? People don't think very straight when cold and this woman already seems a bit weird. Why would you believe her? Right? Besides, you could have mistaken something else for a corpse, right? How do you know that you make contact with the body? Like, it felt like a person. I could feel their hands, their face, their legs, and their hair. You walk over to the hole and attempt to examine it, all the while keeping a safe distance away. In the meantime... My god, Millie, are you okay? Why the hell were you ice skating? Like, Mel, I'm okay. And about the second question, you're like supposed to skate on frozen rivers? That's why it freezes over. Not on this one, the sign literally says don't go on ice. Like, what sign? What do you mean, like, what sign? I'm talking about that sign literally behind you and that lanky dude. <laughs> like your friends in disbelief of her stupidity. You resist the urge to defend your lanky figure, and instead continue looking into the blue abyss. Like, that doesn't matter, I like helped. Help death take over sooner rather than later? Like, no. Forget that the two girls are sisters, judging by their similar appearance and how they're arguing. Ah, that makes sense. In addition, you realize that the only way for you to see if there is indeed a body is by going under yourself. The very worst that could happen to me is that I freeze. If I don't act fast and murder Gabriel will get away with their crime. Um, should I really dive under there? Uh, he could freeze to death. Well, he said he likes the cold, so yeah. Should be okay. You begin to slip your trench coat off. I know, how scandalous. A 20-something-year-old man simply taking off an outer garment. 
and the two women immediately stop arguing. They perk up, and you can feel their eyes scanning your body. Clearly, this is quite the sordid sight for them. Even the more reasonable of the two is left speechless by your not very nude upper body. They're not even shirtless, yet they're taking interest. <laughs> you need to calm down. Alright, Millie, did you somehow bribe this guy to strip for you? Like, no, I think that he's just so charmed by me. Sometimes you don't quite understand this attractions others have for you. A couple of years ago, you taking something off would be viewed as scandalous, but not really in the appealing way. Then again, you never really did realize that puberty hit you like a truck. You'll have a speck Millie and maybe Mel even Mel to begin prodding you to take your sweater off. Oh, <laughs> you just dived in. Before we can hear any remarks of that kind, you dive under the water. Shit, what the hell is this pretty boy doing? Why can't you just let anyone just follow the damn sign? But you're on the ice right now, you hypocrite. Yeah, to come save you, dummy. But Mel, I saw a body. What? Millie, did you down all the meds during lab? Like, of course not. I only downed one. Then what body are you talking about? <gasps> you emerge from the water, gasping for air, and coughing water out. Not the most flattering sight. It was so dark under there that you really couldn't see the corpse and you had no feel for around for it. So you didn't get quite a good look at them. After coughing some more, though, you open your eyes. And it's his friend. Seen a lot of gore while on the job. Your eyes gouged out of their sockets, partially popped like water balloons, beating hearts ripped out of chest, exposed intestines, bones contorted in ways that they shouldn't be, disgustingly pink brains staining rotting carpet. But somehow this? Oh my god? Her breasts have been ripped off, exposing all the tissue to the air. That's just evil. You hate that you're comparing the tissue's appearance to a screwed up flower. Half of her face has been burnt off, skin melting near where her remaining eye is. You can only imagine the pain of having such an intense fire burning so close to your eye. Her remaining eye reveals a glassy, blank scare, stare, void of vivid color. It tells you everything. You were too late. You were too late to save her. And this is the end of the chapter. Uh, yes. And I saved successfully. So that's the end of chapter one. So he finds his friend dead in the span of how many hours? I'll say eight hours if he was at school. So maybe she went on her lunch break and then someone must have killed her. But how they put her under the ice? Well, I guess it was snowing, so it, fr it froze over. But like, God, they killed her in such a brutal way. So I'm going to end the episode here today, so we're ending chapter 1. Next episode, I'll play chapter 2. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Bye!